Known as one of the greatest wildlife sanctuaries in Namibia, Etosha National Park covers over 20,000 square kilometers in the northwestern part of the country. In this episode, we search for as many cuddly creatures as we can find, including the elusive white rhino. Then I chat with the conservationists about the dwindling number of rhinos and what is being done to save them. We're not their natural predators, we're, we're their predators by choice. I give you a tour of the lodge where I'm staying. No matter where you are on the property, you get an endless view of the Namibian savanna and the wildlife that inhabits it. And lastly, I join a local chef in the kitchen to make a hearty dish using dried African spinach. It already smells really this good. Year. This episode is gonna be huge. We're up super early today so we can get a head start on our search for the white rhino. I have to say, this sunrise ain't too bad looking either. Sadly, we didn't have much luck on our search at first. I mean, we did see a bunch of other neat things such as these delicious looking guinea fowl, these super scary sharp thorns, these delectable looking spring box, this super sassy giraffe, these trees straight out of a Dr. Seuss book. We even saw Simba's paw tracks. But wait, is that a rat? Never mind. That's just a gorgeous man elephant headed to Pound Town. After almost six hours of searching, I had lost all hope. What is the point of my life? What am I going to eat for lunch? Then just like something out of the Blair Witch Project, those full-figured babes revealed themselves. We made sure to keep our distance though because these ones just had their horns removed. I have to say, it was worth the wait. The moment you see these beasts in real life, you form an instant connection with them. But sadly, the reality of poaching becomes all too real. I spoke with Mervyn, a conservationist, about this very serious issue and what's actually being done to help save these animals. One actually doesn't really know the real need why they are doing this. Most of the time this has been done just for for the pleasure of aphrodisia. Why do you need rhino horns? Just eat some strawberries, <laughs> eat some oysters, some chocolate. Tell me what the government is actually doing to save the rhinos. What is yeah. the process? Uh, the process is actually quite very simple. The government officials coming in wait for helicopters then they will locate the rhinos, dab them, cut off the horns. Does it grow back? It will grow back but it might take for the older rhinos it might take longer um, compared to the little ones. Okay. What you also don't want to do is to dehorn while there is a little baby that is nursing. Because of you are doing it with a chopper, you have to chase it. Why do you think the little one is going to go during the time? He's going to lose the mommy. There is a little bit of disadvantage in the whole process, but then we don't do it, we lose them. Right. We do it, we keep them for the future generation. Right. At the end of the day, we have to do it. On our way back to the lodge, we happen to drive by the nearby watering hole and to our surprise spot the largest herd of elephants ever seen with human eyes. Well, at least my eyes. There were even some baby elephants. Luckily, there was a photographic hideout where we could safely get up close and personal with these ginormous animals. I feel like these creatures were like, why the hell are these idiots staring at us? We're just some friendly neighborhood elephants trying to drink some water. Nothing to see here guys, move it along. Oh man, but you gotta admit, those baby elephants are cute as a button. Well, a 200 pound button. That's something you don't see on a daily basis. Back at the lodge, I head straight into the kitchen to join the head chef, whose name also happens to be Mervin, to make his favorite childhood dish, mahangu porridge with dried African spinach. We've grown up with it and it's very nice also. Villagers we used to eat that. The first when you're doing the mahango porridge, you should boil the water. It's a giant whisk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the maize flour. Yeah, maize flour. And it's just made out of ground corn. This is mahango porridge. Yes. I see, so it gets even thicker. Yeah, it's getting thicker. You gotta get your elbows in there. You gotta get your work up for the day. <laughs> Now that we have the mahangu porridge made, Mervin chops up some onions and tomatoes and throws them into a hot pan. See, the pan is very nice and hot. You want to hear that sizzle right yeah. when it goes in, right? Yeah. So about five minutes here, five minutes there. Okay. 10 minutes. 
So 10 minutes so. <laughs> Okay, so tell me more about this spinach. You can take it and dry it so like for three days or four days. In the sun? In the sun, and then you can put it in the cool rooms or you can put it outside in the room. Then you can use it for a longer period. So you add it straight into the Into the onions, onions and tomatoes. tomatoes. And add some bit of water. Okay. Then you add some tomato sauce, give it a good stir, and it's ready to go. So how do we eat this? Show me how to okay, do it. What you can, you, before you are eating, you can wash your hands very okay. nicely. It's what we're doing in the village. We have something like this in Chinese culture where right before we eat crab, yeah, yeah. we wash our hands and then we do it afterwards too. <laughs> oh, they yeah. always put some lemon in there. Mm. I always joke that I would drink yeah. it. This is probably not something you want to drink. You can take a little bit of a porridge. You okay. see that we used to make it like this. It's very so, hot. So you can, you oh. take, <laughs> okay. All right, then you can tap it here inside. Mmm, -hmm. a lot of flavor, a lot of flavor and a lot of texture. Mm. There's a little bit of grittiness. Is that mm. from just it being dried? Yeah, that's on the big giant. Yeah. That's delicious. Mm. Thank you so it's much. Also, at the villages, we just eating with hands. I would prefer to eat with hands. Yeah, every hands day. is very nice. It's also. just easier, and yeah. then you don't have to worry about washing forks and spoons. <laughs> when I'm at home, I literally just eat with my yes, hands. Yes, eat with your hands. And it's, it's like nice. disgusting. I, I'm just like a slob, but I don't mm -hmm. care. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mervin. Thank you so much. Now that I've stuffed my face full of Muhangu porridge, it's time to show you guys the lodge. So while we're in Itosha, we're staying at the Safar Hook Lodge, which is built on a private reserve right next to the Itosha National Park. It's quite cool. Let me show you around. As you walk onto the property, the lodge does a really great job of making it feel like home for the next few days while also maintaining that safari charm. First off, one of my favorite spots, the pool. You guys know I love a good pool. The main lodge is warm and cozy and many of the materials used are actually eco-friendly. Not only that, it has a beautiful view of the Namibian savanna. Alright, let's check out my room. Each of the 11 rooms is named after a native plant and is super spacious and comfortable. My room had both an indoor shower and an outdoor shower for those adventurous types, if you know what I mean. When you're done with your shower, you can walk across your patio with your pickleberries hanging out, take a look at the gorgeous savanna, take a nice deep breath, and go on with your day. And the cool thing about this is that no matter where you are on the property, you get an endless view of the Namibian savanna and the wildlife that inhabits it. And that's a wrap for this episode of Craving Jet Lag. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button below and follow me on my social media for more fun content. I'll see you guys next time.